providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. Welcome to another edition of Nevada County Interviews. I'm your host, Paul Minacucci, and today we're going to take a journey to the farthest reaches of outer space with Nevada County astronomer and biologist, Alan Stoller. Alan, th welcome to the set. Thank you, Paul. So um, we're going to learn a little bit about Alan in, in a minute, and um, we're going to uh, give you some of the best images from the Hubble telescope and other um, images that I think you'll just find really fascinating and talk about all things having to do with uh, space. Uh, Alan, let's get have the uh, folks at home get to know you a little better. Are you from these parts originally? Or? Well, I've been here 30 plus years. So yeah. I like to think that more or less from these parts. Right. And uh, you are a biologist by trade. By training, that's right. But I've always been interested in in all the sciences in nature. I'm a mm -hmm. naturalist. Uh -huh. So uh, I, short attention span, I guess, but I like going <laughs> from one thing to another. Right. And, um, and so you, when did you first get very interested in astronomy? Uh, I cut my reading teeth on science fiction. Mm -hmm. So as far back as I can remember, all beautiful pictures coming from telescopes. Right. right. And did you, uh, when would, would you get your first telescope? My first telescope was, I don't know, I've never had a big one. Uh -huh. So what I've done is collected, well, the one I have now is a small one that I can actually carry on my back and take backpacking, uh -huh. which I don't do as much as uh, I used to. I leave the telescope home most of the time, got rid of my camera a long uh -huh. time ago, and just stick with, the, uh, stick with nature when I'm backpacking. Uh -huh. But around here, well, I have the use of, uh, in fact, I'd like to invite the community to uh, join us whenever the Nevada County astronomers go out we go out once a month, and we have, among other things, a 22-inch that one of our people made well, himself. Mm -hmm. So having the use of that, I don't have to own very much at all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so um, we uh, talk about there's different kinds of telescopes, right? I mean, um, visual telescopes um, in, the, in, the, in the range of sight that we normally have. Um, you have refractory and, and reflector. Right. So a refractor is one made with lenses, probably what most right. people think of. But as Isaac Newton showed way back in the early 1600s, you can make a telescope with mirrors, right. curved mirrors. And think of the mirror in your bathroom, the enlarging mirror. Well, that is very close to the mirror in the back of a large telescope. And things that it's much easier to grind a mirror only on one side, and it doesn't have to be transparent, than it is to draw to grind a lens, lens both yeah. sides, and right. glass has to be really transparent. Right. Yeah, and my microscope, uh, my microscope telescope as a young kid was a, a reflecting telescope, so I used to have to carry it around. It was a little bit bulky, but sure. yeah, we, we loved it. Who doesn't love astronomy? I mean, That's true. Yeah. That's true. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the politics of that, and um, uh, I think Alan and I would agree that you know one of the worst things we could be doing in budget cuts is to be cutting off NASA's source of funds. Well, the irony there is whenever someone says, but space exploration is so expensive, and it is. You've got to do everything right. If you can, you try to do everything right. The thing is, though, we as a nation spend more on cigarettes than we do on space exploration. Yeah. So it's really That's pretty way sad. Your, <laughs> yeah. Um, and why do you suppose that is? Do you think that the it's so common among uh, younger, younger generation folks? I mean, for you and I, uh, older f people, I mean, I think it still has the allure and, you know, pioneering aspects of it, you know, the, the great unknown. It is. And what I'm hoping is this kind of slideshow that we'll do on your program and right. that I'll do again for the uh, county astronomers in a week 
that this will turn people on, that a lot of astronomy is in your head. When we're looking even with our largest telescopes, some of the objects we see are really beautiful right in the scope. But a lot of them are fuzzballs, and it's only when you realize what you are looking at and what is going on inside that fuzzball. And that light is coming right to your eye. It's not coming to you via the internet and someone else playing with it. But this is the light from that object that might be, say, two and a half million light years away. That's the farthest thing you can see with the naked mm -hmm. eye in the telescope. It's phenomenal. And that is light that you and only you, really, are getting those particular photons. Right. It's direct, nothing in between. Right. Now, one of the things that I, um, you might want to explain to the folks is that uh, when you look up in the sky and you see um, a, a star twinkling, that's probably a star. And if it isn't, it's, it could be a planet or other solar system because it's reflected light. Is that right? Well, well, what's happening there is stars twinkle because what's happening, if you looked over a hot parking lot on a hot summer's day, you can see the waves of air rising. And when you're looking at the stars, you're looking through hundreds of miles of that. Right. So it just bobbles up the light. When you look at a planet, planets are literally wider. They're much smaller than stars, but they're much, much, much closer. So by being wider, their light can come through several of those bubbles of air. So they don't twinkle like, very often they don't twinkle like right. stars do. All right, that's one way I, I try to distinguish them when we look up in the sky. So now, one of the things that we talk about with uh, regard to outer space is uh, talking about viewing a telescope, and that's within the visible spectrum of light. Uh, tell the folks at home what, what that is. Uh, well, the visible spectrum, and I've written here a little mnemonic, a little memory aid on the whiteboard. It's Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Indigo, just because we needed a vowel in there, indigo is the color of new blue jeans, literally yeah. made from the <laughs> indigo plant. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that is what we can see, but it's a very, very small chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the Latin word for below is infra. So below that we get infrared. Infrared, the near infrared, which is almost like light, but can't quite see it. That's what we use when we're using a uh, remote to change mm -hmm. channels on a TV. You go down below that and you get far infrared, thermal infrared. You can't see it, but you can feel it every time you put your hands up to a wood stove. And it is exactly like light. It's electromagnetic radiation, but our eyes are not sensitive to it. So that's down below red. It means less energy. Think about how when you heat up a piece of metal, it gets first red hot. Well, it doesn't get visible at all. First, you can just feel like right. that wood stove is warm or hot. But then when it finally gets hot enough to glow, it gets red hot, then orange hot, then yellow hot. Finally, all the colors of the rainbow, so it's, it's white hot. And if you go beyond violet here and you add some more color, it's, well, Latin for beyond is ultra so right. you get ultraviolet. And we'll be seeing things in the infrared, a little bit in the visible, just because we want people to see oh, like what the problem is when we're looking at it with the eye. And then to try to investigate it, we use other colors. And then we can go beyond that to the ultraviolet. Beyond violet, another color, color in quotes, is x-rays. Right. Exactly like light. They work. In fact, people have seen, let me just go down this way, be below infrared, are radio waves. Everybody's played with radio waves. When you tune in a radio, they're used in radar. And radio engineers, radar people, have actually seen with their instruments, not with their eyes, they have seen rainbows in radio wavelengths. Hmm. It's the exact same thing. The yes. different wavelengths get spread out. Right. You can't see with your eye. You need an instrument to tell you what you're seeing. But so we've got radio, infrared, Roy G. Biv, the visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, just to finish it off, this is atomic radiation, nuclear right. radiation, gamma rays. Gamma rays, yes. And so those are the high energy, really dangerous exactly. waves we're talking about. So radio waves are bouncing around all the time. Infrared, right. we can feel as heat, not dangerous unless you get too much of it. Visible, certainly not dangerous. But then you start getting into ultraviolet, and you watch out for that right. skin cancer there. That's right. X-rays, we know are dangerous. Gamma rays are... Deadly, yeah. Yeah. And so... Um, the human body, in fact, emits radio waves, does it not? Right. It's everything that's above absolute zero, which is pretty much everything, will emit electromagnetic radiation because we're so cold compared to so many other things. 
we pretty much emit a little bit of radio, and that's about it. Not, right. and, and a little bit of infrared, too. You could, I imagine if you were very, very sensitive. Oh, yeah, of course. There are thermometers that you can just aim it at a person and tell what his temperature is. Well, that's the infrared you're giving off. Right. And so uh, why, is this, uh, why is this the study of light in, in the visible spectrum, how does that come to play when we talk about uh, exploring outer space? Well, the first thing we look at with our naked eye is visible light. And one of the interesting things is a lot of the rules that we all know, and I'll put no in quotes because maybe we haven't written it down and noticed exactly what's happening, but sunsets are red because as the sun is going down, well, first of all, the sky is blue because blue gets easily scattered by molecules of air. So it just gets scattered all over the sky. If there's no air, the sky is black, like on the moon. So the blue gets scattered and the yellow, so the sun looks yellow to us because the blue is scattered out really in space. It should look a little bit whiter because the blue doesn't get scattered. So you've got that blue getting scattered and then it gets more and more exaggerated as the sun goes down. The sun turns orange and then it turns red because red can make it through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then you can extend that same principle. Even red gets scattered if you've got enough molecules and especially enough dust. So we get to a point, and we'll see in one of the slides tonight, that at the point where you get too much dust, you cannot see anything in visible light, but you can still see below red, you can still see infrared. Mm -hmm. And we'll see some pictures. So, so of pictures that are shot that are come to be in the infrared spectrum. Right, right. Yeah. And so, um, now tell us also, now we hear about, uh, you have electron you know, uh, microscopes and you have um, telescopes that are, are, are magnetic um, driven and they're not in the visible spectrum, is that right? Right, yeah, we've got gamma ray telescopes in orbit right now. Mm -hmm. They've got to be in orbit because the atmosphere does not allow gamma rays to come all the way to the surface, fortunately. Right. Same thing with X-rays, got to go into space to see X-rays. Ultraviolet, the extreme ultraviolet, you've got to go into space, and for most of ultraviolet, to get a good view. But you can go to the tops of mountains, tall mountains, and get some ultraviolet down, and obviously that near ultraviolet is what gives us a suntan right. or a burn. Then visible comes through, and then you go down to infrared. You can do that from the ground if you've got a good dry site, again, a mountaintop, because water vapor loves to absorb infrared. Right. Radio comes right through, so some of the earliest, well, the earliest radio telescopes were here in the United States, but when people were really going for it, Britain, which is not known for having clear skies, sunny skies, uh -huh. but they do have some of the earliest radio telescopes. Right. And so what uh, the images we're going to see, some of them are, sh are within the visible spectrum and some are not? Mostly not. Mostly yeah. invisible, things that would be invisible to our mm -hmm. eyes did we not have instruments. Right. So let's start our slideshow right now, if we can, and we'll pick up the first JPEG. That's the last one. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have the last well. one first. Um, we can talk about that. So one of the things you look for in anything, in science, you look for patterns. Ah, oh, there we go. There it is, the first yeah. one. Now that's, believe it or not, is the sun, right? That is our sun, but not in any light that we can see. That is in ultraviolet light, and specifically, now that's a false color. It could have been any color in the world. The people who made this image decided to make it green. You wouldn't be able to see it no matter what it was, because this is in ultraviolet. And what we're seeing is the ultraviolet given off by, I'll say, damaged iron atoms. So this is iron in the outermost parts of the sun, the corona, the crown of the sun. The temperature here is over 2 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is way hotter than the surface that we see just when we take a glance at it with our eyes. That's only 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's mm -hmm. nothing. That's cold. This is 2 million in order to excite those iron atoms enough. And you can see where it's especially hot because it's especially bright white. Right. And then there are places in that image where it's dark and there it's relatively cold. It might be only one million degrees, I'm guessing here. And what we're seeing here is a pattern on the sun of dark and bright. And what we're also mapping out here is the magnetic activity on the sun. Those bright parts are especially intensely magnetically active. 
and there's those little halos that are on the side and springing from the uh, sun in this picture here, the little white um, pieces, is, is that, uh, are those flares or? Not quite flares, but let's go to the next yeah, one. Yeah, electromagnetic. Uh, yeah. So now we're a bit closer to the surface of the sun and you can see loops coming off it. And those are loops, those are the magnetic lines of force coming out of the sun and going right back into it, very close to where it came out. So here we're again looking at iron, we're again looking in ultraviolet, but this is a bit cooler, a bit closer to the surface of the sun. And this is one of those bright spots where the magnetism is especially intense and there's just there's so much happening here. For one thing, where magnetism gets intense, on the surface it prevents heat from mm -hmm. coming out. So that's where we get those cold, cold sunspots. I mentioned the surface of the sun is only about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Sunspots are frigid. They're like 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. which on the sun is nothing. Relatively yeah. frigid, yeah. But you also get, and as you mentioned, you can get flares. And it's kind of like if you have two powerful magnets and you're pushing them together north to north and like poles repel. And if they're really powerful, and I love bringing them into my classes, and I'll tell the students, now, some of you guys are going to get bit, and I've done it to myself, so I won't necessarily laugh at you, but it is kind of funny that I'm warning you, hold on to these tight, because they will bite you. And sure enough, they're pushing them together, pushing them together, and they, it's so hard, one of them jumps out of their hands, snaps to the other one, and if their finger happens to be in the way, they get bit. Yep. So that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. when you get a flare. What seems to be happening is it's called reconnection, where those lines of force are being forced together more and more, they don't want to be forced, and suddenly something gives, something flips, and they just snap together. Mm -hmm. And it blasts out a tremendous amount of radiation. Let's, uh, let's take a moment and talk a little bit about the sun. And um, we are uh, experiencing this year a, a lot of uh, hyperactivity on the sun, and uh, some of the flares are quite magnific magnificent, aren't they? What we've been getting are coronal mass ejections which can be related to flares. Sometimes they happen at the same time. A flare might trigger one. These, the corona, what we saw in that green sun, that was the corona. That's the part that's 2 million degrees Fahrenheit. And at times when things get magnetically complex and the thing just blasts off, the sun will eject, oh, I don't know, a billion tons of itself. Now, the sun can eject a billion tons and never even notice it. It's like a mosquito bite or less. So that then carries, it flies through space at a million miles an hour. At a million miles an hour, the sun is like 93 million miles away, so it's going to take two days to get here. Right. So we know it's coming. Mm -hmm. That's why the space weather people put out warnings. It, something is coming, and if, the sun, if that part of the sun happens to be facing us, we know it's going to hit us dead on, as this last one just did. What are the impacts on planet Earth? Well, as was discovered, hundreds of years ago when fir people first started really looking at the compass and realizing that the compass, first of all, they realized the compass does not point north, it points to somewhere off of north, and then that it changes, and that it could change gradually over the years, and then they found it could change in a matter of hours and even minutes. And scientists in the 1800s were building compasses with like foot-long needles so they could really study with a lens that slight quivering. Well, now these days, we have stuff, I like to joke with my students, that we have stuff in our kitchens that a physicist 100 years ago would give right. his eye teeth for, right. like microwave ovens. If he could have generated microwaves 100 years ago, it would have been dynamite. So now that we have lasers, we can, as I did, put together a magnetometer. It's essentially a very powerful but very tiny magnet suspended on a very, very fine thread. Fine thread, you have to do something like dissect a piece of dental floss and get the finest little piece of nylon and then glue a very, very tiny mirror onto it. You then shine a laser on that mirror, and it will go across like two meters, six feet or so. Mm -hmm. And what you're getting is that laser beam, even though your magnet is hardly moving as the Earth's magnetic field changes, that laser will magnify that motion, and you can just see it on mm -hmm. the wall six feet away. Wow. So what happens, and what I like to watch during these coronal mass ejections when they hit us, is the coronal mass ejection will create electric currents, literally electricity, flowing through the ionosphere. The ionosphere is what allows us, it's electrified air, but it's like 100 miles up. 
that's what allows you to pick up a radio station, an AM radio station, right, from, from L.A. or Texas or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. And only at night. Right. Because conditions are only correct at right. night. I, and in fact, that happened to me uh, during one of these. I was coming back from Sacramento at night, and I was uh, pulling in uh, Utah. So, oh, yes. I love yeah, that. It was clear as uh, day, you know. Right. Um, what other – but those, uh, those coronal ejections really can wreak havoc with – uh, you know, anything that has to do with uh, uh, radio transmissions. Exactly. Well, so you get these currents going through the atmosphere above our heads, tremendously powerful, more powerful than all the generating stations on Earth put together. And whenever you have an electric current, you get a magnetic field. Right. So this magnetic field comes down and it bathes the Earth and bathes the rocks. You will get currents flowing through the rock, and there are maps of uh, the United States and of the whole world that show where the rocks are especially susceptible to getting magnetic currents because then you get the, excuse me, electrical currents in the rock. Well, you get that electrical current, you then generate another magnetic field and we have these long power lines. Power lines are excellent antennas for these yeah. magnetic fields. They'll generate these random, very large electrical currents in your power lines. They'll blow out the transformers. Right. So back in 1989, uh, Quebec, just blew out, and they were out for some time. Right. So what we're entering into now, this is 2011, about 2013, should be the maximum of uh, the solar cycle, although the peak, the magnetic cycle, peaks a bit after the sunspot. So 2013, 2014 should be the, the best time for these blasts. Now, if I seem to be enjoying it, I hope folks will forgive me <laughs> for it, because, yes, we might lose some spacecraft, and we uh, might, the power might go out, but for those of us who enjoy watching it on our magnetometers mm -hmm. or on the internet, it's fun. Right, uh, and, and those, uh, those events occur on a more or less predictable basis? I mean, It's an 11 year cycle. Yeah. The sun flips its magnetic field every 11 years, goes from north to south uh, in, in 11 years, and then another 11 years will go back from south to north. Yeah, it's a little off topic, but we're, we're talking about the Earth magnetic field is going to do a flip-flop or has it's in the middle of one I mean uh, well, some people say it happens very slowly um, where are we with that well it happens on average every three quarters of a million years and the last time it happened was three quarters of a million years ago but that's only an average it can go another two million years mm -hmm. without it happening and it should take place all over the earth we have evidence in the rocks that get magnetized when right. it happens evidence that it takes like three, four, or 5,000 years for it to happen, except two places on Earth, and the first one to be discovered was right in southeastern Oregon, right above the uh, California border. Steens Mountain has evidence in the lava flows that it might have happened at least once in 10 days. Wow. But people are looking at that. That you know, makes you raise your eyebrows. So yeah. people are still investigating that. That would be an interesting, uh, interesting <laughs> yes. phenomenon, to yes. say the least. Okay, so let's go back to, um, I want to try to go back to the slideshow, if we can. So, oh, yes, what? yes. We Mac had it. one. <laughs> okay, so here we have, now we're looking in infrared because there's so much dust. What we're looking up is we're looking at is dust that's glowing just by its heat. It's not giving off any light at all. That blue part there is a very young newborn star giving off tremendous amounts of heat, which is why it looks blue there. Now, blue is just a false color, but the scientist investigating this said to the computer, well, you see a lot of infrared energy coming out. Make it blue. But there's a fair amount also in these filaments, and there's some other not quite so intense newborn stars in those filaments, too. We would not be able to see this. There's no visible light coming out of that because of all that dust. But just like the red of the sun comes through the dust during sunset, infrared will come through even more dust. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how, how we suppose the, a star is born? Stars are born out of giant clouds of gas and dust. And if folks will join the Nevada County astronomers sometime will be in the next few weeks is when the sky is clear and we're back in the dark of the moon, we'll be inviting the public to uh, join us to look through telescopes. It's free. And it's on the website, which we'll give at the mm -hmm. end of this program. You can look right now. The best example of that is in the Sword of Orion. Mm -hmm. 
and Orion is a constellation of the winter. He's got a belt of three stars and hang down yeah, from those three stars. Yeah, the easiest constellation to, to see. Yes, usually, yeah. yes, probably the first one that most people mm -hmm. learn. And there's a dagger or a sword hanging down from his belt, three stars. The middle star, even in binoculars, does not look like a star. It's fuzzy. Mm. And in a telescope, you see a cloud of gas and dust with several baby stars right in the middle of it. And stars are formed when clouds of gas and dust collapse on themselves. And in the middle, you get a star. And very often, it seems, as we're learning now, around from some of the gas and dust left over, you get planets going around those stars. Right. Really fascinating. It would be great to be able to document that if we could somehow come upon the right, just the right moment. <laughs> if, if we could, yeah. A younger and younger star. Yeah. Yes. So let's go on with the next, uh, which is a, a spiral this, uh, shape. This is a spiral galaxy. And this one, this might be the only one, maybe there's one other, that was made in visible light. So this is something that we can't see with ordinary telescopes. You can see the spiral arms, and that thing just tells you that thing is spinning. Well, back in the middle of the 20th century, astronomers realized that something is wrong with this picture because this galaxy, like many spiral galaxies, is spinning so fast that the stars, well, think if you were spinning a rock over your head on a string and the string broke. Well, that, that rock would go flying. Here, the string is gravity. And we look at how many stars we can see in this galaxy, figure out how much gravity all those stars would have. There is not nearly, nowhere near enough gravity to hold on to all these stars. So we shouldn't see a pinwheel here. We should see these stars flying it off in all directions. So the question is, what is holding on to these stars? Where is the gravity coming from? So if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. which was made in several different wavelengths, This is where we get the hypothesis that the universe is made of more than is in our books. Here we are finding, this is some of the first good evidence, besides the fact that those stars are going too fast, for what's called dark matter. And here we have two galactic clusters. Stars come in galaxies. Galaxies themselves come in galactic clusters, where you get a dozen several dozen, maybe hundreds of galaxies all going around each other, all bound by gravity. And sometimes clusters will collide. So we see a cluster on the left, more or less in the blue, a cluster on the right, again, in that, that blue hazy. And you can see the clusters themselves, those fuzzballs, and they're coming at each other. And where the gas that surrounds those galaxies is colliding, hydrogen gas, smashing into each other, those atoms of gas smashing in, they're getting not red hot, not orange hot, not yellow hot, not even white hot, even beyond ultraviolet hot, they are getting X-ray hot. So those pink areas show us where our X-ray telescopes mm -hmm. have indicated there's lots of X-rays coming right out there. Well, that's interesting, but that is not yet what we're really seeing, what's really interesting about this image. We're seeing a lot of galaxies in the background surrounding the blue and the pink. And what's happening there is that their images are tweaked, kind of like tweaked as if you're looking through a funhouse mirror. Mm -hmm. Back when Einstein published his theory of relativity, the thing about a theory is that you need to say, well, here is what you experimenters, you observers, should look for. I am making predictions of what you will be able to see. And one of the things he predicted is that gravity would bend light, like right. a funhouse mirror would bend light. And about 10 years later, astronomers went out to image the sun during an eclipse. And they said, well, the sun, having a lot of gravity, should tweak the light of stars that look like they're just to the side of it. We can't see them normally during the day because the sun is out. But during an eclipse, the sky gets dark. And so in 1919, astronomers made images of the sun and the stars. And sure enough, the stars were not quite in the right place. Their light was getting bent by the gravity of the sun. So what we have in that image I was just showing was the background stars and the background galaxies behind. They're not quite the way you would expect them to be. Mm -hmm. So we know how much gravity there is in these clusters. 
and it's way more gravity than we would expect. We would expect yeah. And we can figure out where that gravity is. And we can map where that gravity is. And that is where the blue is showing us. What this blue in this image is showing us is where the dark matter, the invisible matter, matter that does not interact with light, with electromagnetic radiation. It's not only invisible to our eyes, it's invisible to our instruments. It simply does not interact with electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. And this is where it is. So, so why is it called matter? If it, if we, I mean, it has mass, it, it does... Exactly, that's yeah. all it has is mass. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because it has mass, it has gravity. Right. Beyond that, we, are, we don't have the slightest idea what it is. So that's the force that's keeping the spiral together. Could we be, presume. Yeah. We presume. There are a lot of ifs and ands there. But, right. Uh, and, and if so, I mean, that would be a new force for us, right? I mean, we, we don't have right. such a thing on Earth. Not, it's not quite a new force. It's the force of gravity holding them together, but yeah. it's a new form of matter. Yeah. And it would make up, oh, I forget what the percentage is, but more than half, I think it's more than three-fourths of all the matter. Yeah. In, in the universe. In the universe, yeah. So let's talk a little bit, uh, before I go on the slides, the size, we're talking about the, the universe, uh, and even that's debatable whether we're alone in that, right? I mean, there may be more than one universe. We could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, how many, uh, so how many stars are typically, I mean, I know it's a wide range, but uh, how many stars are usually in a galaxy? To, well, just take our galaxy. Yeah, There's Milky Way. probably about 100, maybe 200 billion stars in our mm -hmm. galaxy. So 100 say, or 200 billion Yes, yeah, so let's say 100 billion stars. And interestingly, it's just about as many neurons, as many nerve cells as you and I have in our brains. Wow. So our brains are much more complex. In fact, our brains are about the most complex object anyone has tried to study. That's right. And, um, and so we have 100 billion stars in a galaxy, and how many galaxies do we think are in the universe? Ballpark guesstimate, 100 billion galaxies in our mm -hmm. universe. So 100 figure, billion. So you put that together, there's a bunch of, of uh, stars in the, in the universe. Now, it could be that at this very moment there are people watching TV and someone's about to say, do you think there are other people out there? And they'll probably say, no, nope, can't be anyone else out there. Right. But, but you think there. about the mathematics of it, it would be almost impossible for me to think that there were, weren't. Uh, you know, that we're so alone, um, it would be amazing if that were true. So. I'm, I'm with you. I, yeah. So far, we have absolutely no evidence of any other life anywhere except on Earth. But I'd be surprised if there were no yeah. other life somewhere in the universe. Talk a little bit about um, the SETI project. What, what is that? I mean, it's looking for life, intelligent life in the universe. How do they do that? SETI, Search for Intelligent Life. And so search for extraterrestrial, excuse me, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Right. And uh, looking for essentially figuring, we here on Earth put out a lot of energy, as especially as radio. We've got radio and television going out, of course. We've got radar going out. That's putting out a lot of energy. So we're figuring, well, other folks, if they're out there, would be doing the same thing. So we got, well, if you go to, and I drove up with a friend, to Mount Lassen, and we went north of Lassen. And the thing is, as you're driving north, you can be enjoying all these radio stations, and then you drive behind the mountain, and you cannot pick up any radio stations, which ex is exactly why the ATA, the Allen Telescope Array, was built there, because it's radio quiet. It's in the radio shadow of the Bay Area, of all sorts of places that are putting out all this radio energy. And we were out there just as they were putting up their first three telescopes. And these are radio dishes. They look like oh, people used to use, uh, big dishes uh, used to use to pick up TV. Wow. And uh, they were putting up the first three. Now they have several dozen up there. And what they're doing is listening. The thing that's interesting about the ATA is that it's the first radio telescope array that is first looking for extraterrestrial signals and then doing some astronomy. All the other searches for extraterrestrial mm -hmm. intelligence have had to piggyback on top of radio well, telescopes. It's the first unique, dedicated. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, so far, um, as far as I understand it, except for one anomaly, and I forget when that was, um, we haven't heard any cluster of, of radio waves. That, coming from the universe, other than what we create. That was the wow signal. Yeah, the wow signal. It, it was just a spike in radio energy, 
And the guy who was looking at the charts wrote, wow, and that ever since became the wow right, signal. Right. And so people have been looking at that part of space and nothing has nothing ever come Nothing new in. has come in. And, and when you're doing that, you know, you always say, well, could it be a car went by with bad ignition? Could it be the refrigerator went on or off or something happened? And they look for that. They couldn't figure out it was anything else, but at the same time, they couldn't find another signal. So you have to just have to say, who right. knows? So how far do, does a radio wave um, project itself out into the universe? It goes to infinity, but mm -hmm. it gets weaker and weaker, just like when right. you shine a flashlight. If you're real close, that spot of light looks really bright, and from a few feet away, it gets dimmer, and then you move away, it gets dimmer mm -hmm. and dimmer and dimmer. Same with radio. So it does go forever, but at some point, it gets so weak, you can't pick it up. Right. Now, before we go on, too, uh, one of the phenomenon is that w when we're watching a star, it's very, very far away, and so what we're seeing is millions of years old. Uh, correct? That, right. And, well, the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, is four light years away. So the light we see from that star is four light years old. The moon is just over one light second away. So th what you see on the moon is one second old. You see the moon mm -hmm. as it was one, one second ago. Right. It's 186,000 miles uh, per second. Oh, 186,000 miles a second. Yeah. The speed of light. And so Which light years are the number of years it would take that, uh, a light wave to, to, to go that so, distance. So a light year is the distance light can go in one year, which is 5.8, almost 6 trillion miles. Right. A long way. A long so way. when we talk about Alpha Centauri and our other close-by uh, galaxy planets or possible solar systems, we're talking a, a, a huge distance. Right, definitely huge yeah. distances. And until we can figure out space and time uh, wormholes or some other way of doing it, it's just not practical to think that we would be able to physically visit that uh, that star. That's sure the way it seems. Yeah. Um, and plus, one of the things we could talk about if we have time is the whole idea of people who are in outer space at very high speeds have a different aging process than people who are on Earth um, because of the, the nature of you know speed in uh, space-time continuum. Relative to us. Now, yes. they would look at their watch and say, well, the mouse's hand's on 20 minutes after. So for them, time would just go by normally, just as it does to us. But relative to each other, time would be going right. by very differently. Right. So let's go back to uh, our slides. We've got... All right. This is uh, one of my favorites. It's now, very when, aesthetic. When it, oh, that's, that's what got us all into astronomy, I think, as kids. When you're in a boat, you look at the bow and you get a wave. The water can't get out of the way fast enough. So instead it goes off in a wave, a bow wave. And probably most people have heard of a, uh, or heard a sonic boom. That is a shock wave. That's what we're seeing here is a bow wave or a shock wave where a star has been, it probably was in orbit around another star that destroyed itself in an explosion. And the explosion was time, the geometry was just right, that it sent this other star flying, flying so fast. And when it hit this cloud of gas and dust, and you can see the cloud of gas and dust around it, it caused a shock wave in the dust. And that's what lit up here in infrared. Mm -hmm. And um, just by reference, uh, well, first of all, one of the things that people, I think, never think about is that we're, we're situated on Earth, and we don't know, but we're traveling through space at 40,000, I, I forget now, we're, we're, thousands Earth, of miles an hour. The Earth is going around the sun at 60,000 miles 60, an hour. 60,000 miles, yeah. And the sun yeah. is going around the center of the galaxy at, uh, I forget what, some like a quarter of a million miles right. an hour or something. So we're not aware of it. No, um, everything's going with us. Yes. And in this case, this, that star, how fast could uh, it sorry, be? I don't you know. don't know that? I don't know. Which leads to another question, I think, about uh, the nature of the creation of the universe and where we are in that process, um, so-called Big Bang Theory. And uh, I think most people believe and hypothesize that we are in an expanding universe. What does that mean? Well, it means that when we look out far enough, now a lot of folks are confused. They say, well, are you and I expanding, or are the galaxies we look at in the telescope nearby galaxies, are they moving away from us? And as long as we're bound by gravity, or even don't, you and I don't have to be bound by gravity, we're bound by electromagnetism, holding our atoms and molecules together. But we're bound to the Earth by gravity, Earth is bound to the Sun by gravity, 
The sun is bound to its galaxy by gravity, and our galaxy is part of a cluster of galaxies all bound by gravity. So no expansion going on there. But you move far enough out, and you come to where gravity, just like the light of a flashlight gets dimmer and dimmer, gravity gets weaker and weaker. It goes forever, but it gets weaker and weaker. You go far enough out, it's not able to hold on. And what we find is, as if you go far enough out, everything is moving away from us, everything is moving away from everything else. So it does appear that the universe is indeed expanding. That's, right. And we see that by the redshift. And right. people have experienced the redshift in sound. If, if someone's going by you honking their horn or a yeah, peace siren. The Doppler effect. The Doppler shift, right. right. And Doppler actually, when he realized it should happen mathematically, he hired a brass band and put them on a freight, this is in the 1800s, right. he put them on a flat railroad car and he had them go past him at 40 or 50 miles an hour and sure enough he could hear it. Right. And so um, that's one way of looking at this expansion. Yeah, uh, that things are moving apart, so essentially the light waves are getting stretched. Right. So um, what's on the other side of the expansion? I mean, there's nothingness. Nothing with a capital N, literally right. no, you know, when you go out in space, no it's, it's a vacuum. Yeah. But light can come through a vacuum. Radio goes through a vacuum. There's time in a vacuum. Outside of the universe, there is simply nothing, no time, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that? That's, uh, uh, our equations tell us that. If we don't mm -hmm. know it, it's our, our poor brains, that's, mm -hmm. that's how we uh, And so, um, different people have different hypotheses. You mentioned off camera that we may be expanding to the point that the fabric of time-space continuum might be stretched so thin that it rips. That is something very new from the late 1990s mm -hmm. where people were wondering for many years, is there enough matter? What, for when they first realized that the universe is expanding, this would be back in the 1920s, and they said, well, is there enough gravity? Because gravity does pull on everything. Is there enough gravity to stop the expansion and maybe just stop it and that'll be it? Or maybe even enough gravity to pull it back again and perhaps start over. It'll all go down to a big crunch and then it'll blow up in a big bang again. Or if there's not enough gravity, not, not enough matter in the universe, then it'll just keep on expanding forever. And aesthetically, people were really looking for an answer that said we would just barely come to a stop. And that was looking good and people were collecting evidence. And then two different teams of astronomers found evidence in the late 1990s that not only is the universe going to keep on expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. We're expanding faster and faster and faster such that, and this is gazillions of years from now, I mean billions upon billions upon billions of years from now, everything will totally rip apart. The, not just the atoms, but the subatomic particles in our bodies will rip apart and that's all, it's all, it's all over. It's all over until the next Big that, Bang. That's all folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Possibly. So let's talk about the Big Bang, um, if we can. Uh, Big Bang Theory says that, you know, the universe uh, was created in a billionth of a second or less than, less than that, a lot less than that actually, uh, but a very small amount of time with a Big Bang, an explosion of, of stuff that uh, happened to uh, explode and create, create, create this expanding universe. Well, one of the things I get a kick out of that no matter your spiritual, religious persuasion, our physics tells us that we can never know what happened in the absolute first instance, instant of the Big Bang. And it's a very tiny fraction of a second. It's one over one with 43 zeros. But still, that's enough for God to have said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. So we will never know. But after that, we can trace back and we can look and try to figure out what happened. Now, astronomy only takes us back to about the... Uh, when the universe was a third of a million years old. And a lot happened, you know, a lot happened in the first minutes, such that when you come to a third of a million years old, the universe looks a lot more like the way it is now than it looked in the first instant. So beyond that, well, you can go with mathematics and try to figure it out. And essentially, that's why we have things like the Large Hadron Collider in, at CERN on the Swiss-French border where we know there were subatomic processes going on. They were very, very hot. You have machines that are literally 50 miles across 
to collide subatomic particles where it would take a gazillion of them to make one inch, the tiniest particles. But what you're getting there is essentially these high energies, you're getting temperatures of gazillions of degrees. You're mimicking the earliest right. universe. And people, all kinds of theories about that, right? I mean, that people don't know what will happen and, you know, where we create a, a separate universe by mistake, uh, you know. <laughs> the people were concerned about that, yeah. and it uh, didn't look likely, so they went ahead and turned the machine right, on. Right, right. So now, so we're looking back, at least, uh, you know, using telescopes or even uh, the electromagnetic uh, imaging, uh, and we look back through time, because as far as we can see, um, you know, that occurrence was happening billions of years ago. How far back to the Big Bang do you think we will ever get in terms of being able to recognize an event? With our telescopes, actually, folks who have TV sets, which is most of us, however, folks who have TV sets attached to an antenna, not to cable, and you tune in a station that's not broadcasting where you just get snow and you get that white noise, that shh sound, and you, you look at the snow and it's like white dots showing up there, and that is noise, electromagnetic noise. And most of it's coming from inside the set. Some of it's coming from your refrigerator, your washing machine, cars outside, things like that. But about one out of 100 of those white flashes is actually coming from the universe. And what it is is microwave energy, radio energy coming in that was emitted, and it was emitted as intensely hot electromagnetic energy. But it's now microwave energy that can be picked up by your TV receiver and translated. And your TV receiver says, oh, I saw something. And what it saw was a photon coming in from what I mentioned, the farthest back we can go, that time when the universe was a third of a million years old. It's now 13 and a half billion right. years old. So that's pretty impressive. And you yeah, sure. We're, your TV we're way close to the... Yeah. And so why can't we ever get, do you think, to the, to the Big Bang itself? Just before then, the universe was too hot for atoms to come together, for electrons to attach themselves to their nuclei and stay attached that way. Mm -hmm. So because there's just this plasma, just like submarines cannot communicate, cannot set, send most radio waves. There are some exceptions, very low frequency but they cannot use ordinary radio to communicate right. because salt water, the sea, mm -hmm. is a conductor. Right. Well, you had a conductor there, and it was just opaque to anything, to any electromagnetic radiation, and it just couldn't come through. So it was only when the universe became transparent at a third, at a third of a million years old that photons could escape, mm -hmm. and we can now pick up those photons. Right. So let's go back. I think we have a few more slides we could be looking at. Here there we, we have, go. Here we have something similar to what our sun will look like in about 5 billion years. This star has puffed off. This, again, is visible light that we're looking at, that orangey stuff that has those filaments there. Puffed off its outer atmosphere. That's what ordinary-sized stars like ours do. And then they settle down to become white dwarfs. And I show this one because you can see right in the middle something interesting is going on. But you can't see very much. But now if we go into the next slide, we can see what's going on in the middle of this. That. Here we have the red part is ordinary star stuff. And that was picked up with an ordinary telescope. But in the middle, that blue is false color because we wouldn't be able to see it. Those are x-rays giving off by something very violent, very energetic, very hot going on just outside that white dwarf, that new white dwarf star, which you can see mm -hmm. is that white thing right in the middle. As far as what's going on, no one is very sure, very possibly this thing had a companion star that is sculpting the stuff that this star gave off, sculpting into those beautiful swirls. But that's a lot of, uh, as geologists call it, hand-waving and arm-waving. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, how, so as these uh, white dwarfs are formed and they are collapsing and on them, imploding in on themselves. Actually, that's, you're thinking of neutron stars, which we will get to oh, in a okay. moment. Yeah. White dwarfs are simply 
like our son, our son just, giving up the ghosts. Yeah, no they, more they energy. They do shrink. You yeah. know, you're right in that sense. They do shrink, and they get very, very dense. Now, that's enough that if, you know, you had a marble, like kids play with marbles, if you had a marble made of the stuff of a white dwarf, that marble would weigh a ton. Mm -hmm. So it's so, pretty dense, unusual stuff. And the next slide we have... Now we get to a star larger than our sun. Oh, two or three or four times larger than our sun. When it runs out of fuel at the end of its life, it implodes. It does collapse mm -hmm. on itself, like you were talking about. And the implosion is so violent, it reaches a state in the center that could be called maximum scrunch. I've heard people refer to it as that. And matter does not like to be scrunched maximally, so it then explodes in what's called a supernova. And we're seeing the, the remains of that supernova. The green part is x-rays given off by the shock wave as this thing blasts itself out and hits the galactic, the interstellar uh, gas that is surrounding that star. You can see out at about 10 o'clock there's something red. Apparently something happened that was even more violent to send a jet of matter out even faster than that shock wave is going out. I'm not quite sure what that is, but again, picked up in x-rays. What we're seeing here is this star giving up its matter, like the star we saw before, like the sun-like star. That star and this star and a billion other stars give up their matter to the galaxy. Some of it will collect in clouds of gas and dust. Do you remember I talked about clouds of gas and dust right. collapsing on themselves like one of the earliest stars to form new stars and new planets. So the stuff in our bodies, the hydrogen and helium, well, no helium unless you have balloons, but the hydrogen in our bodies, and lots of that because it's in water, that was created back in the Big Bang, the creation of the universe. But the oxygen we're breathing, the nitrogen in our proteins, the phosphorus in our DNA, that was formed inside stars, and the only way it could get out was for those stars to explode, like this star we're looking mm -hmm. at right now, and then that stuff to collect in clouds of gas and dust and form stars like our sun. Right. That's a really interesting and somewhat comforting you know, idea that uh, it's cyclical and yes. you have life and it gives itself back to the universe. Um, and, and how dense is, when this implosion takes place, before the explosion, how dense is that star? What you get left with, if the star was big enough and the implosion was humongous enough, it could form a black hole. Right. But if it's not quite that large, it will form instead a neutron star, which is essentially an atomic nucleus 20 miles across. Wow. And atomic nuclei are phenomenally dense. Atoms that we're made of are mostly empty space. Most of the mass of our atoms, of our bodies, are in exactly. our nuclei. Almost right. all the mass is in our nuclei. And there, if you had a kid's marble, that marble would weigh something like 200 million billion tons. And what in our universe weighs that much? Well, if you go out, not tonight, it's, it's, uh, the sun is hiding it right now, but you might be familiar with the Kepler mission, yep. which is staring at one spot in space to look for planets like our own. That spot in space is not looking towards the center of the galaxy, which is towards Sagittarius. It's not looking towards the edge of our galaxy, which is towards Orion. It's looking sideways in another part of the galaxy, just like our own. It's looking towards Cygnus. And in Cygnus the Swan is a really good probable, really good candidate black hole. Mm -hmm. And um, for the uninitiated, what, what, is a, what is a black hole? What, what happens in it? I mean, I know some of this is, you know, of course, speculation and it's... Uh, well, we do have really good candidates, so chances yeah. are we're pretty sure black holes do exist, even yeah. though you mm -hmm. can't see them. And the reason you can't see them, well, if if I throw a ball into the air, say 50 miles an hour, it'll go up 50, but then it'll slow down 40, 30, finally it'll slow down to nothing, and it'll fall back down again. If I throw it up somehow 10,000 miles an hour, it'll go up farther, but it'll still slow down and fall back down again. But if I could throw it at 25,000 miles an hour, it would escape because that is escape velocity from the Earth. It would never stop. It would never fall back. It would head out. And that's what we do when we send spacecraft to Mars. Right. So that thing is really traveling. 
Well, suppose I had an object like the earth. Suppose I could collapse the earth to something the size of a large marble, two-thirds of an inch across. I would have to throw that marble, excuse me, I have to throw that ball 186,000 miles a second for anything to escape. 186,000 miles a second is the speed of light. Right. Well, that means that not even light, if it were a little bit smaller than that marble, yeah, not even yeah. light could escape. Right. And, and that means that no light could escape. That thing would look black. And its gravity would be so intense that anything came near it, it would be like a hole. Right. And so we call it a black hole. Can't see black holes because they're black. But we have evidence that they're out there because of what they're doing. Exactly, to the for everything around, around it, yeah. So um, we have about two minutes left. Is there a How about if we go to the last slide? Yeah, and let's go to the last is, slide. And here we have, we're looking towards Sagittarius. That white spot is known to astronomers as Sagittarius A star. And a star because it's got an asterisk. And what that is, is the best bet, in fact, almost no doubt, there is a black hole in the middle of whatever is there being hidden. This is in radio wavelengths. Radio, even better than infrared, comes through dust. And it is coming through. Notice those, that arch there, those lines, those parallel lines. That is something organized, organizing the magnetic fields of the center of our galaxy. So you look towards Sagittarius this summer, and you're looking towards the center of our galaxy. You're looking through a humongously dense, it weighs as much as 300 million stars like our sun, 300 million suns. And it's sucking in everything around itself. Things around it are just yeah. going like mad, and it's organizing the magnetic fields around itself. Right. Well, this is a fascinating subject, uh, Alan, and I hope uh, you'll come back. Love to. And we'll uh, explore some more things. Uh, you know, uh, in special relativity and some other time space questions that I certainly didn't get to today. So uh, I want to thank Alan Stoller for being our guest today. I want to thank the uh, crew for a wonderful job, as always. Uh, uh, and this is uh, Paul Manacucci, Nevada County Interviews, signing off for now. Bye bye until next time. Our Northern Sierra propane team is a family-oriented business that is committed to giving you fast, prompt, and reliable service. Our goal is to